All right, I needed to grab something really important. I didn't want to forget. Okay, here we go. What did one volcano say to the other? I lava you. Very well done. What kind of dance do mothers like the best? What kind of dance do mothers like the best? The mamba. Well done. What asks no questions but has to be answered? What asks no questions but has to be answered? Phone's good. Phone's good. Doorbell is what I had. We'll take phone for a replacement. Okay, what did the football coach, last one, what did the football coach, why did the football coach go to the bank? What's that? Get his quarterback. Well done. All right. All right. <clears throat> you guys are getting sharper. Sharper as the semester goes on. Okay. So today we're going to, launch into hypersensitivities in autoimmune diseases. And if you spend a little time looking at the reading and you looked forward into the slides, you're going to see that we're going to cover four hypersensitivities. Okay, one, two, three, four. And <clears throat> what I want to share with you is this is the categorical labels that we put on these hypersensitivities for our class here at Northern Arizona University, Bio 320. Now, you move on, you get into other coursework, you go to other institutions, you read other textbooks. You might see uh, similar, but maybe there are some hypersensitivities that are in different categories. Okay? Does a hypersensitivity know what category it is? Does it care? No, this is our nomenclature so that we can actually write test questions and evaluate students to see if you understand. Okay. So what I mean by that is we've created these buckets that we put these diseases in, and they're not perfect categories okay? because it's biology. But for the most part, they're going to work. And as you move on, you'll see most classically the central dogma or the most popu popularly accepted uh, characterization of hypersensitivities comes in four categories, one, two, three, and four. Okay. And <clears throat> let's start off with what is a hypersensitivity? So a hypersensitivity, can anybody define it for us? What's a hypersensitivity? What does the name suggest? The label, what does it suggest? Perfect, okay? So it's an allergy would be an example. It's an immune response, but maybe your system overdoes it. I'm a full believer of using the word to define the word, okay? So you're hypersensitive to some sort of trigger. That's really all it means is it's an immune response. It's an immune response, unfortunately, that causes tissue damage because it's inappropriately triggered, and it's inappropriately maintained. So what that means is it happens maybe when it really shouldn't happen, or maybe when you don't want it to happen, um, and it's overdone. It's triggered, and maybe it's too much. It's way beyond what it really should have been. And then it stays elevated for a much longer than necessary period of time. There's a period typically with hypersensitivity, again, define it using the word itself, you're hypersensitive. And you've used this, right? You've used this in regular common speech. So-and-so is hypersensitive, right? What is the deal, right? They need to relax. So think of the immune system as that person. The immune system cannot relax, and it is on edge. And it is inappropriately triggered, and that is maintained beyond what it really should be. The sensitization that takes place is important, and we'll see that specifically with an IgE-mediated type 1 hypersensitivity. 
So <clears throat> an example of this would be like a hives response where you're allergic to some allergen. The first time you see it, you may get a little bit of a rash, okay? You become sensitized to it, meaning that your body learns that allergen. You make memory cells as a result of it, right? Memory B cells. And then the next time, it turns into a full-blown hives reaction, where now you've got hives all over your body, inappropriately triggered and inappropriately maintained. So we're going to walk through these categories of hypersensitivity, and this is a roadmap for today. So you can appreciate we've got type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4, just like I promised, four, four categories. Now, the first three categories that we'll look at, the first three categories are B cell mediated. So if you're taking notes, you could put like a big bracket here and say B cell mediated or B cell involvement. There's a B cell that gets engaged and there are antibodies that are produced. So another way of asking that question would be types 1, 2, and 3 involve antibodies because B cells are involved. Type 4, T cells are involved, and it's the only one. Type 4 <clears throat> is also referred to as a delay hypersensitivity with T cell involvement. And it's actually associated with transplant rejection. That's the best way to remember it. So the example of type 4 with transplant rejection is where you take one kidney and you put it into a donor or a, a recipient. Take it from the donor and you put it into the recipient. Another example of type 4 is, is a diabetes type 1 where it's a cytotoxicity T cell mediated response towards the pancreatic beta islet cells. Okay. Now backing up, one, two, and three, different types of antibodies in different configurations. And we'll spend most of today in types one, two, and three. We might get to type four. We might have to finish that up most likely on Wednesday. So if we look at the roadmap, type one individuals, or sorry, type one mediated hypersensitivity involves IgE. And this is our allergy response. This is our classic allergic reaction. And we alluded to this back in unit one when we talked about B cells and we talked about IgE and we talked about IgG and IgM. Remember when we talked about the monomers, the dimers, the pentamers? So we're kind of using some old information from unit one. Remember, this class is cumulative. And students, sometimes they groan, but I think you guys have been more conditioned now. When I say that the, the exams are cumulative and the class is cumulative, um, you have to remember that your professional career is cumulative. Right? Life is cumulative. So if, you are, if you're a future physician or you're a future uh, PA uh, or a future dentist or whatever, you know, you'd say, you know what, I saw something really like... I learned about this in dental school, this monster abscess, just like what you have, but I totally forgot what to do. So I'm going to call you back in two weeks after I figure it out. They're going to be like, what? what? I'm not coming back in two weeks. See you later. So you're going to have to retain some of this information from unit one. But the good news is the unit one foundational stuff, and I promise you, I may not hear from you, but I've heard from a lot of your predecessors, like when they move on in life, they'll email me back going, holy cow, we just went through this whole inflammation uh, lecture, and um, it was crazy how much I actually remembered from taking your class. It's kind of cool. And we're using it every day in clinic, and you know, so the stuff in unit one is foundational, and I promise you'll take it with you when you move on professionally. So IgE, unit one, it's not that far back to recall. It's just a couple of weeks back. But IgE is tied to type one. And there are certain individuals, we call them atopic individuals, 
where they're just genetically predisposed to making more IgE than the next person, okay? And they are more sensitive to allergies. There are certain people that you know that are just like a walking allergy, right? They're allergic to everything. And there are other friends that you have that you just get so like annoyed with because they're not allergic to anything. And you're like, what is that like? Okay. And so atopic individuals are ones that are predisposed to having more allergies than others. IgE is the lowest concentration of all the immunoglobulins in circulation. And so when it gets triggered and when it's maintained, you have a monster response. And we'll look at that here in a second. Type 2, moving down the list. We skipped all the way to the bottom because <clears throat> I wanted to contrast the first three from number four. Type 2, this one is called tissue-mediated or specific antibody-mediated. And the best example or a good example would be blood transfusions. And so with type 2, um, and if you guys, you guys probably remember back to uh, Bio 202, second semester A&P, when, when you did blood typing, maybe in the lab, and you found out what type of blood you have. So play, uh, red blood cells are anuclear, right? During development, they spit out their nucleus, and now the red blood cell kind of has this concave. It looks like a not fully formed donut, right? It's kind of got like two, you know, two like little pinches on either side. So you've got this, you know, concave um, red blood cell. And there are surface antigens that show up on these red blood cells. These surface antigens... Um, are referred to as um, blood antigens. And <clears throat> so we're, we're at a red blood cell, and there's kind of like a little, you know, indention. It's not a hole. It's an indention. So if you look at it from the side, it kind of looks like this, right? And they have these little antigens on here. They might have an A antigen here. This one might have a B antigen, okay? And so if you have the A antigen, you're type A. If you have the B antigen, you're type B. If you express both antigens on your surface, what are you? A, B. If you express no antigens of this type on your surface, what are you? Oh, very good. So you already know that if you have type A blood, can you receive blood from a B, type B patient? What will happen? The antibodies will be produced. It's actually a type 2 hypersensitivity. Okay? So you already knew about this. They just didn't call it type 2 in 201, or 202, rather. You with me? Then the other one is the rhesus complex. That's the RH complex. So you're either RH positive or RH negative. You guys remember this? So these two main ant blood antigens are what are responsible for transfusion mismatch. So we'll see another example when we look at um, type 2 later today. But that's a classic example to, you know, you know, flash you back to 202. And most of the antibodies that dominate type 2 are, an IgE and a, are IgG and IgM. Now type 3. Type 3... <clears throat> is an immune complex, an antigen-antibody immune complex. So in this situation, the way that it's uniquely different is the type 2, the antibody itself circulates in the blood. And with the type 3, all right, there we go. so with the type 2, We've got our antibodies that circulate in the blood. And they're going to bind to some tissue. And the tissue expresses the antigen, and the antibody binds. Okay. <clears throat> in type 3 with a complex, here in the blood, you actually have the antibody that circulates and then the antigen is also found circulating, and it forms a complex in circulation. And then this complex in circulation will actually go on, and it'll get stuck somewhere. 
okay? And where it's going to get stuck is in places, because it kind of agglutinates, it's going to get stu stuck in locations where you have blood flow and maybe filter activity. So you'll see it in joints. You'll see it in the blood vessels themselves. You'll see it in the kidney. So that's type 3. And so we'll look at a type 3, but the big difference between type 2 and type 3 is type 2, the antigen is found on the tissue, and the antibody finds the tissue and binds. In type 3, you form this antibody antigen complex, and then it actually gets trapped somewhere else and causes an issue. Is that pretty clear? It's important that you're able to quickly distinguish between type 2 and 3, and a lot of students mix them up. And so we'll talk about some examples as time goes on. Okay. We covered type 4, <clears throat> but just for sake of completeness, antibodies can be involved, but there is, more importantly, a T-cell involvement. So in type 4, it's not that you don't have antibodies. You might, but you've got these T-cells which are absent in type 1, 2, and 3. All right, so that's the roadmap of where we're headed. Now we're going to dive straight into type 1, and we'll just see how far we get today. 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm guessing we'll get through the first two, maybe three, and we'll have to finish up type 4 on Wednesday. Okay. So type 1. <clears throat> this is IgE-mediated response. Uh, allergen or an allergic reaction. If we look at this diagram of what's happening, we've got at the bottom, let's go all the way to the bottom, we've got an immediate response and then we have a delayed response. Those are those two boxes. This happens right away. This happens two to eight hours after exposure, the delayed response, the lower right box. So this is in our mucosal lining. Let's pretend this is in your nasal epithelium. Because all of you know, if you're allergic to something, your nose kind of starts to run, you get stuffy, right, sniffly, your eyes then start to water, they get itchy. And all of this is because of this allergen. In this example, it's called a pollen, right? So if you're allergic to uh, some particular flower or tree, maybe you have an olive tree allergy, or you're allergic to ponderosa pines. I would hope not, but unfortunately, a lot of people are, believe it or not. You're like, that's a thing? Like, it's absolutely a thing. More people are allergic to ponderosa, and their pollen is ridiculous. They shed their pollen. Have you ever seen the pollen shed here in town with the ponderosa? It, 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 it's yellow, just like what's shown here. And if you have, like, a black car, you'll have a coat of yellow over top of your black car, okay, when they dump their pollen. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. You can see sometimes when there's times of um, when the pollen's shedding and the times where, where there's not much rain, which happens a lot, and the wind's blowing, you'll see the pollen kind of like blowing on the street, like almost like a little cloud. It's pretty crazy. So let's pick your favorite pollen, okay? Or this, couldn't, this may not necessarily be the mucosal lining. This could actually be your gut if you have a food allergy, right? If you're allergic to gluten, if you're allergic to um, uh, seafood, right? This could actually be the mucosal lining in the back of your throat for certain food allergies like seafood allergies or peanut allergies. But let's see what happens. Well, it binds to a B cell, and then you've got a nearby T helper cell. This is called the TH2, a subclass T helper cell. And this pollen binds to the B cell. The T helper cell comes over here to help activate. Now the B cell actually converts into a antibody secreting B cell dumping out the IgE. The IgE binds to a mast cell. The mast cell, um, when it sees the allergen a second time, now it binds two antibodies and it dumps or degranulates its contents, which are vasoactive amines, mostly histamine. So 
this is the response leading to most of the activity from an IgE-mediated response is a histamine release. And if you remember back to inflammation, what does histamine do? You guys tell me. Vaso something, right? Vasodilation, what's that mean? Vessels get bigger. So what happens to transudates and exudates? They start leaving, right? This is in the inflammatory phase. You get a lot of tissue edema. You get a lot of swelling. You get redness. You guys remember this? Right? Is this indicative of what happens when you have an allergic response to one of these things? Absolutely. So the way that we combat this, and you might want to write this down, what's a over-the-counter medication that you can use to block histamine? Huh? Benadryl, right, which is an antihistamine, and that's why it works. In fact, for a lot of food allergy patients, having Benadryl on hand really facilitates shutting down this hypersensitivity. So the vasoactive amines actually are immediate, right? This stuff happens right away as this degranulates. And then cytokine production, these uh, mast cells crank out, and it takes a few hours, two to eight hours-ish. It cranks out more cytokines that also cause vasodilation, but in a late phase. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the second exposure to an allergen. Because there are patients that, let's say, for example, they'll travel to Phoenix, Arizona, and they come for um, one winter. They, they're snowbirds. And they become sensitized to some of the allergens that you see here. And they, they take some over-the-counter allergy medications, and it seems to help. Well, now the next year they come back, and this is technically their second exposure. What cells that have a long-term memory did we learn about in the last unit that make antibodies? Memory B cells. Okay, so when you have this reaction that takes place on the late phase, you make cytokines, you also create a population of these memory B cells. And so on the second exposure, the memory B cells activate more quickly and more aggressively. So let's look real quick, and then I'll get to your question. <clears throat> On the second exposure, now you've got the IgE ready. And the IgE is ready. This is a mast cell that we found on the previous slide. The IgE is ready for the antigen to show up, and two IgEs bind one single antigen. And the response is actually much faster and much more aggressive. And you've got two main things that take place, right? We've got um, degranulation like what we saw last time. And the degranulation dumps primarily histamine, but proteases as well as chemotactic factors. What are these chemotactic factors for? They're actually to recruit what cells out of the bloodstream. To go phagocytose the allergen that's present. Sounds like ages, starts with macro, ages. Very good. Well done. So macrophages, they're tissue, or they're tissue macrophages that recruited out of the bloodstream that were circulating monocytes, right? So this degranulation um, activity happens very quickly. The other thing that happens uh, relatively quickly is you take the membrane phospholipid, and do you remember this precursor known as arachidonic acid? So you have arachidonic acid on hand, and now you can generate very quickly prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And what do those two substances do? Are they vasoactive substances? Do they help facilitate inflammation? Yes. And so the inflammatory pathway is dramatically upregulated because we have histamine happening and in parallel we have arachidonic acid creating intermediates that are vasoactive, prostaglandins and leukotrienes that cause vasodilation, smooth muscle spasm, 
right? Smooth muscle spasms. Smooth muscle lines your bronchioles. What are the bronchioles? Those are those small airways in your lungs. So if they spasm and constrict, what happens to your breathing? You can't breathe. You get tight. It's, you start to wheeze, right? Some of you that are allergic to, like, cat dander or, or dog dander, you can step into it. How many of you are allergic to, a, to pet, pet dander? How many of you are so allergic you can tell when you walk into somebody's front door they have a cat? Yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, oh, boy. Right? And you're trying to be polite and all that, and you look in your, your purse or your bag, and you're like, I hope I brought some Benadryl, right? But then I'm going to fall asleep you know, with my drink, and they're going to be like, wow, Rob can't even handle one. Look at him. Oh, he was drooling on himself. No, I promise I'm just allergic to your cat. Okay. So this is the immediate response that takes place on the second exposure. And then look at what happens on the late phase, right? So the leukotrienes actually funnel in to a more delayed response versus prostaglandins, and you start manufacturing additional cytokines. And those cytokines, like these leukotrienes, facilitate additional leukocyte infiltration. Those are those white blood cells, those monocytes that become macrophages. And it causes epithelial damage. That's the topmost layer of whatever epithelial surface that allergen was found in. And you have additional bronchospasm or like a allergy asthma induced response. Okay. You had a question, and it was probably a while ago. Oh, like an allergy to like a penicillin? Yeah. yeah. So the question is medical allergies. So it depends. So in some cases, it might be a gut interaction. If it's absorbed into the bloodstream, it could actually be systemic. Okay. So for example, people that are allergic to penicillin, depending upon how aggressive the allergy is, they could have like gut irritation. They could have diarrhea. It could be very uncomfortable. As it's absorbed, they could actually break out in a rash because now it goes all over the body and they could break out into a rash, okay? So it could be anywhere from they don't feel well, going to the bathroom a lot, all the way to a rash. And then in excessive circumstances, it can actually cause uh, bronchiospasm if it's systemic and it can even cause what we, what we know as laryngospasm, okay? Now, uh, like food allergies, but a lot, so a lot of the medications they have a half-life in the body, so you consume them, and they break down with, with a certain profile because you don't want to absorb them right away. So that they break down with a certain profile, and all medications are different, right? So, you know, for example, sometimes you'll get a shot, and they'll deliver it IM intramuscularly, or they'll deliver it sub-Q, right, or they'll deliver it, um, in some cases, IP intraperitoneal. So all of those are based upon absorption characteristics. So if you take one orally, peros, um, it's, got, it's been formulated to break down at a certain rate. Um, whereas like if someone has a peanut allergy, it doesn't wait till it gets to the gut. If they eat like a peanut butter jelly sandwich, their mouth will start itching, their throat, or like a seafood allergy, a shellfish allergy, okay? Uh, so it all just depends on how quickly the allergen is going to become bioavailable. Okay? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so... To summarize on the second exposure, faster and more aggressive. Faster and more aggressive. You're like, that would have been a whole lot easier to say. Why didn't you just say that? Yeah. Question. question from, uh, what are our, like, what are the allergy Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so the question is on allergy shots, right? So allergy shots are interesting and you can achieve this using a couple of different modalities. People actually can be dosed on um, and they'll do it themselves. They'll become desensitized to certain allergens by exposing themselves to small doses over a long period of time. And that's what allergy shots are doing is they're titering back the allergen exposure, and so they're giving you titers of, of allergen to desensitize your body where it 
now we can see greater and greater concentrations before the B cell is going to do anything. Does that make sense? So you give a little bit, and you, you get a small reaction, and then you back it off the next week. Then you give a little bit more, and you may not see the reaction. And the next week, you back it off a little bit. And then the next exposure, you give a little bit more, and you don't see a response. Now you're starting to get the effect. So, people, so, so some people will do this like with, uh, with bee pollen or with honey, local honey. I don't know if you've heard of this strategy. People that have lots of allergies, this is like a homeopathic strategy. And there's a lot of science behind it, is they'll move into an area and they'll get local honey. So the bees from that area collect the pollen from the local plants. And so the honey is indicative of the allergies in the region. And so they're not like just <sighs> with the honey, right? They're taking a spoonful and maybe they'll dilute it down, right? And it's basically kind of the same thing in a homeopathic way as allergy shots, like the honey desensitization. But again, don't just, you know, make yourself a big old peanut butter and honey sandwich from the local area and expect your allergies are going to go away. You, you actually have to approach it kind of in the stepwise fashion that we just described. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, growing out of it um, <clears throat> is a similar thing, whereas the exposure was there and the immune system has adapted and it's gotten stronger and now it's going to take more to trigger the same response than before. So that's kind of the grow out of it mentality. Yeah. Okay, great questions. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about type 1. So some of these are, are, are pretty gnarly. Okay, a lot of you have experience with allergies. How many of you are pretty allergic to something? Like in, 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 into a point where you'd get nervous. Like if you got stung by a, an, a bee tomorrow, you might be going to the ER or if you had penicillin. Okay, so this will resonate. Um, so I have a daughter. One of my daughters is rather allergic to shellfish. And, um, and so this is funny, haha, now because we're beyond it. But we didn't know. And so we do this little thing like on Valentine's. I have four daughters. And so we do this thing on, on Valentine's Day where we have a Valentine's like really fancy meal. Like we, you know, bring out China and everybody gets dressed up and they dress me and usually I'm wearing pink something. And um, we have this huge spread like uh, lobster, crab legs, you know, surf and turf. So there's like Wagyu steaks. And we've always made a big deal out of it. Well, my third daughter... Uh, loved, never really liked um, the fish. She's not a big seafood fan anyways, but we always had a rule like you have to try it, okay? And then, of course, at this meal, we almost guilted her into eating, you know, lobster or crab legs. Well, after like the first two years of doing this when she was really young, we noticed that she was getting kind of itchy. And she's a very atopic individual. She's She plays with our dog, and she just you know, you can tell, you know, she's like three times as big as when she started and you can't see her eyes, you know, she's all puffed up and, and um, you know, we're pumping her full of Benadryl and telling her to take a hot shower. So um, after about the third year, it finally, finally dawned on me. I'm like, wow, I wonder if she's allergic to shellfish. Like, ha ha, right? I would have failed my own exam. Uh, but we figured out, we got her tested and she's absolutely allergic to shellfish, okay? So what are some of the symptoms? <clears throat> what do these symptoms include with vasoactive amines? You guys can tell me in an allergic response. What are they? What happens to you? Itchy, okay. Pyruritis is itchy. P-R-U-I-T-I-T-S. That's a clinical term for itchy. Bronchospasm. Bronchospasm. What is that? Bronchial airways constrict. Laryngospasm. The larynx, the back of the throat, narrows and constricts. It becomes hard to breathe. And in our Alyssa, that's exactly what she said that third year. She's like, so I'm having trouble breathing. I'm like, what? Right? I was like, you're allergic to shellfish. I figured it out. It only took me three years, right? Uh, conjunctivus. What's that? Conjunctivitis. Red eyes, right? Rhinitis. 
R-H-I-N-I-T-I-S. Rhinitis. R-H-I-N-I-T-I-S. Rhinitis. What is that? Runny nose. Runny nose. Very good. Okay. Um, gastrointestinal cramps, especially if it's a food allergy and it's in the gut. <clears throat> uh, lots of cellular infiltration and tissue damage that's occurring. And if this is a food allergy, it could lead to like diarrhea-like symptoms. And so patients that have aggressive food allergies until they figure it out, a lot of times they're misdiagnosed with like irritable bowel syndrome, okay, until they, until they figure out what in their diet they're responding to that's causing the diarrhea, okay, or runny, runny stools. Um, a lot of excessive mucus secretion or hypersecretion of mucus. And this is due to, this is an I and an L. So interleukin-13. Interleukin-13 is a, one of those cytokines that's manufactured by the mast cell that's a late responder. So <clears throat> here's a picture of a normal larynx up top. So we're looking down the patient's throat, and then on the lower right is a laryngeal spasm, an acute laryngeal edema. So you can appreciate the narrowing of the, of the airway, and look at the surrounding tissue. Look at how swollen and how red it is. It is an inflammatory reaction that's happening in the larynx. And if you pause for a second, I just said an inflammatory reaction that's happening in the larynx. You probably can nerd out for a moment all the things in unit one that you know about inflammation, right? You know that there's vasodilation due to histamine. You know that there's additional vasodilation by lipid-derived arachidonic acid making leukotrienes and prostaglandins right? You can appreciate that the fluid edema is coming from the leaky vasculature that's in the tissue, and the redness is because there's an increase in blood flow. If you could measure the temperature of that tissue, what do you think it would be? Elevated. Is that fair? Because of an increase in blood flow. Okay. So type 1 Anaphylaxis is a hypersensitivity and allergic response where the patient now is going into a dangerous situation. We call it anaphylactic shock. So this could be due to a food allergy, an environmental allergy like a wasp or a, a bee sting or certain types of medications like penicillin. Okay, questions on type 1. We've just been typing, talking about type 1 thus far. That's it. Type 1 hypersensitivity. Pretty crazy, huh? So how many of you have asthma? And you have allergy-induced asthma? Okay. All right. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in our respiratory section when time, time, you know, shows up. But a true allergic asthmatic response like if like take back to the um, to the cat example if you're allergic to cat dander a lot of patients develop like wheezing when they're in that house for a little too long like it's hard to breathe that's a type 1 asthma response so all the things that we're talking about this is what's happening at the level of the lungs okay and the level of the back of the throat yeah Okay, so, so they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. So if someone has an allergy to pet dander, um, the reason that they're having an asthma attack is because that dander is airborne and it's irritating the lung epithelium. Now, if they pet the cat, which they would never do because they know they're allergic, and then they go rub their eyes 
what do you think is going to happen to their eye? It might like blow out, okay? It's the same allergy, it's just two different epithelial surfaces, yeah. Now, <clears throat> some patients are, have allergy-induced asthma, and then they also have like um, exercise-induced asthma, okay? Or they have basal asthma that's chronic that they medicate. We'll talk about, this isn't to talk about asthma, we'll talk about that in the respiratory section, but if you have an, like an asthma attack when you are around certain pets, or you're around certain like flowering plants or things like that. That's what this is. That's what's going on here. Okay. Okay. We're shifting gears to type two. You guys ready for type two? So type two is tissue specific. Tissue specific. It may actually be, in my opinion, better to call it antigen specific. Because the blood typing falls into a type 2 that we characterized in the very beginning, like on our roadmap. And <clears throat> you get this antigen antibody complex, but I want you to write in this space, this happens at the level of the tissue, not in circulation. So remember back to my horrible drawing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's embarrassing. Right? Remember this. I don't even want to put it on the video. It's so bad. But type 2 is the antibody finds the antigen bound up somewhere in a tissue. And type 3 we haven't yet talked about. So this is an antigen antibody complex that forms at the level of the tissue. So we're going to look at a couple of examples here that are kind of interesting. Uh, so the one that's, that's uh, being shown here is in a situation where you've got a streptococcal infection. How many of you have strep throat historically? Okay, it's pretty common. Uh, how many haven't had strep throat in a while? It's been years, yeah. So it's more common to have a streptococcal infection when you're young. Okay, strep throat is far more prevalent in pediatric cases uh, because of the immune system. And then you sort of develop these antibodies that can tackle it. So a streptococcal infection, a lot of times it targets the back of the throat, the tonsils, and you get strep throat, you know, those like white caps that everyone's always asking about. But <clears throat> this strep, streptococcal bacteria doesn't stay isolated into the tonsils or the back of the throat. It actually will circulate through the body. And as in sort of this little like chain looking red squiggly thing, this is getting into the circulation into a lymph node, which is intimately connected to the vascular supply, if you remember back to 202. But once it's in the lymph node, the B lymphocytes see it, and they start manufacturing anti-strep antibodies. These anti-strep antibodies go into circulation to go find the streptococcal bacteria and neutralize it. And that's how you get rid of a streptococcal infection. So you can recover from strep, contrary to popular opinion, you can recover from a strep throat infection without going to the doctor. It just takes longer. And we are not a patient society. So as soon as your throat hurts, what do you do? You need antibiotics, right? right? I need some of the pink stuff, doc. You know, you guys are old enough. You don't need the pink stuff anymore. But you guys remember the bubblegum pink stuff? Yeah, OK. Um, so that's the strep throat that you all remember. It's legitimate. You feel horrible. You're, you have a bacterial infection that's systemic. Your body's manufacturing these antibodies. But guess what? Those antibodies have a specificity that is not unique to streptococcal. And this is where the type 2 hypersensitivity comes in. So you see these antibodies that are circulating in the blood. They actually can find analogs that they'll bind to in tissues in your body that they're not supposed to bind to. So for example, they'll find places in the heart and around the heart that they can bind to, whether it's vegetations on um, the papillary muscles or within the myocardium itself or on the surface of the heart. And so that antibody binding to an antigen in the tissue is causing a type 2 hypersensitivity response. The first most well-characterized was called the Ashkoff body 
pathology. So this is, uh, they were previously called Ashkoff Geibel bodies because it was Ludwig Ashkoff and Paul Geibel who independently discovered these. But now, I don't know, Geibel didn't donate enough money or something and he lost nomenclature and we just call them Ashkoff bodies. But these are typically a result of a case of rheumatic fever. And in these cases of rheumatic fever, this is an inflammatory disease that follows a streptococcal infection. Um, in the old days, we called it scarlet fever. And <clears throat> there's a cross reactivity to the antibodies for this strep infection. And the cross reactivity targets binding sites in heart muscle, in joints, in skin, as well as in neural tissue in the central nervous system in the brain. And with rheumatic fever, the illness develops about two to three weeks after the strep infection. And then the, the rheumatic fever um, itself usually would capture children between the ages of 6 to 15 years of age. So historically, what would happen is on explant or on autopsy, we would see these Ashkoff bodies where this is a scar formation in the heart, but this wasn't a patient that, that expired from myocardial infarction. This is a patient that expired because of an infection or maybe complications due to rheumatic fever, and you've got these Ashkoff body formations because the strep uh, infection created antibodies that had specificity to my, uh, myocardium, okay? So Ashkoff geibel bodies, areas of inflammation on the heart that are because of cross-reactivity to a type 2 hypersensitivity. So <clears throat> what are some of the outcomes? Well, we've seen some of this before, but in type 2, when the antibody signals to the antigen, you can either have you know, a phagocytosis response, or we can have what we call an infl inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response is what we're seeing with our Ashkoff bodies in our myocardial tissue. So with inflammation, we've got neutrophil recruitment. We've got complement recruitment, both of these causing damage by the release of these reactive oxygen species into the surrounding tissue, and that's what causes that tissue trauma. So two additional examples of a type 2 hypersensitivity. This day and age, we don't see a lot of scarlet fever. We see a lot of strep throat. We might have a, uh, a secondary reaction to strep throat. We'll see it in the kidney section when we talked about, when we talk about um, glomerulonephritis. So there is a situation in, in young children after a strep infection, it could actually develop some of these kind of complications in the kidneys because of a filtering of these, of these uh, antibodies. But what I want to draw your attention to right now are two examples, and they should actually be somewhat familiar because you typically cover them in 201 and 202. Uh, so in 201, we typically cover myasthenia gravis, and then in 202, we typically cover Graves' disease. But we're going to cover uh, Graves' disease in much more detail later in the semester when we talk about our endocrine diseases. But I want to introduce it to you right now. <coughs> so these are antibody-mediated cellular dysfunction where we've got our antibody binding, again, to our tissue and causing a problem, OK? There's a hypersensitivity. So myasthenia gravis literally translates as muscle weakness. That's the terminology, okay, in the original text. So myasthenia gravis in the original Greek, muscle weakness, we've got an antibody that now is binding. We're on the neuromuscular junction. Do you guys remember this? So here we've got the synaptic end bulb. We've got our synaptic vesicles that are fusing with the membrane and dumping acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine is supposed to go from the nerve to the muscle. This is the muscle. 
and it's supposed to bind to its acetylcholine receptor and then open the gates for sodium and propagate the action potential. Okay, do you guys remember that? So at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine takes an electrical signal to a chemical signal and then back to an electrical signal. It's the translator. It facilitates the action potential. If acetylcholine doesn't bind here, does the muscle fire? Do you get contraction? No. So the antibody for myasthenia gravis is your body has manufactured autoantibodies. Why? Why would it do that, Keller? You guys tell me. In what situation would your body make autoreactive antibodies? Tell me what went wrong. You need to talk to your neighbor. This is important for you guys. To, this is a light bulb moment for you to put together. So talk to your neighbor if you don't understand the question or ask me to phrase it a different way. Any takers? I haven't finished the story yet. Normally, we're going to release acetylcholine and it's going to bind here, but there's this suspicious looking antibody that we made, and it is binding to the acetylcholine receptor and blocking the ability for acetylcholine to bind. Therefore, the action potential is thwarted. Right? Isn't that a good word? I like that word, thwarted. So muscle weakness, it's a combo of Greek-Latin, myasthenia gravis. Greek myasthenia gravis for Latin. Muscle weakness, it makes sense, right? Why in the world would you make an antibody to cause a type 2 hypersensitivity that's autoreactive to the acetylcholine receptor? Any ideas? What would have happened? What could possibly have gone wrong? What's that? Take it. Ooh. You should speak up more. You're completely accurate. Well done. Well done. Did you guys hear that? So we have a B cell that we made in our bone marrow. And we only have central tolerance. We don't have peripheral tolerance. And it's autoreactive, making autoreactive antibodies, and it leaked out of the bone marrow into the periphery, and it never was signaled for apoptosis. And it's manufacturing an antibody that is autoreactive to our own acetylcholine receptor, and it's blocking its activity, and now we have a hypersensitivity pathology. Does that make sense? It was totally spot on. Who doesn't get that? Because this is like kind of the secret ingredient for this whole section. To understand what you already know and apply it to what is going awry. You want me to say it one more time? <coughs> okay, I'll say it one more time. So normally at this neuromuscular junction, you have the nerve. It dumps out acetylcholine. It binds to its receptor on the muscle. And you get the propagation of the action potential and you get muscle contraction. But we've got this antibody that we made, and it's binding to our own acetylcholine receptor because it has an affinity for it, and it's competitively inhibiting, it's blocking acetylcholine from finding the receptor. The reason that this antibody exists and was made is because there's a B cell that made it out of the bone marrow that never should have. It should have been triggered for apoptosis or reprogrammed in the bone marrow. But B cells, unlike T cells, do not have peripheral tolerance mechanisms. And so once it got out of the bone, bone marrow, it was able to make these antibodies 
And this is the disease that results when that patient makes autoantibodies from a self-reactive B cell that makes it into the periphery it is suffering from myasthenia gravis. So this is a disease that gets progressively worse in patients where their muscles get weaker and weaker and weaker. Yes, sir. It doesn't exist normally. It only exists in myasthenia gravis patients. In myasthenia gravis patients, this antibody is present, and in you and I, it's not. Does that make more sense? This antibody is the disease, and this is a type 2 hypersensitivity. Okay? Second example over here another type 2 hypersensitivity. So in the beginning of the semester, I asked about different, you know, what's your favorite, I didn't say it this way, what's your favorite disease, but, you know, like, okay, that's sort of morbid. But you guys were throwing out different diseases. Did anybody stop and think, like, why the heck do we have all these diseases? Like, there's got to be some root cause to how they show up. So you're starting to see an example of how they show up. You've got B cells that are autoreactive that never got screened and signaled for apoptosis. So the second example, Graves' disease. So in Graves' disease, same thing. You've got a rogue B cell, a misbehaving B cell that came out of the bone marrow. It never got reprogrammed. It never was triggered for apoptosis. And it's making TSH antibodies. So thyroid-stimulating hormone antibodies. They bind to the TSH receptor in the thyroid on a thyroid cell. The thyroid is located, not the thymus, but the thyroid is located in a very similar area, kind of above the heart. And the thyroid is responsible for a lot of metabolic activities. T3 and T4 are the thyroid hormones that it makes. Okay? It's a key organ for your endocrine system. And so if you have thyroid disorders, some of you might know friends or family members that have a thyroid disorder. So I have one of my daughters that has an underactive thyroid, okay? So she doesn't make enough thyroid, and she has to take a thyroid supplement every morning, a T3, okay? And the thyroid and the thyroid cells manufacture thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone regulates metabolism, okay? So <clears throat> in this specific example, this one, which is conveniently colored red instead of yellow because it's a different antibody, totally different disease, but it's made by a B cell that's autoreactive to the TSH receptor. So it binds here, and it triggers activation even though no TSH is actually present, okay? So this one blocks, this one actually stimulates. It stimulates the receptor to make too much thyroid even though there's no hormone binding here. The TSH hormone, if you guys remember, and we'll go over this again, but the TSH hormone is made by the pituitary, okay? It comes from the anterior pituitary in the brain and it's released down onto the thyroid to make the thyroid active. So in these patients, if you're making autoantibody and you're ramping up metabolic hormone, even though your body said don't make it, what are some of the symptoms of Graves' disease? An overactive thyroid. What do you think happens there? They lose weight. Metabolism is through the roof. They have trouble sleeping at night. Their heart rate is through the roof. Okay? They're, they're like, you know, on rock stars 24-7. They behave like, you know, they're hopped up on caffeine. So three examples of a type 2 hypersensitivity that we've covered here, <clears throat> right? Ashkoff bodies, um, ashkoff geibel bodies. Then we've got our myasthenia gravis, and then we have our Graves' disease. So we've just covered three type 2 hypersensitivities, all because 
of autoreactive antibodies. Want to bet there's more? Yeah, there's a ton more, right? Do you see, do you see how, how all these pathologies come about? We're just talking about three in a very short amount of time. Okay. All right, we're going to quickly uh, summarize three and four in the next couple of slides, and, and then we'll come back to them, okay? So the next couple of slides aren't the whole story on three and four. We'll come back to them on Wednesday, but we're going to introduce them right here. So in type three, I'm going to go back to this phenomenal diagram I should have spent more time on because I keep showing it. And on this diagram, we've got type three down here where you get an antibody antigen complex that forms in the bloodstream, and then it gets lodged or trapped somewhere. We call these what are referred to as medium complexes, and that's what's shown on the screen here. Medium complexes. So these medium complexes are going to form in the bloodstream, and they're going to get trapped somewhere where the blood is actually filtered, the blood actually perfuses. And so you see kind of some typical destinations, blood vessel wall, which is obvious, kidneys, and in joints, because in the kidneys, the kidneys are a giant filter of blood, and joints because the synovial fluid is actually filtered from the bloodstream. And so you can appreciate here, this is an example of the blood vessel complex. We've got our antibodies floating around the blue structure binding to an antigen that's floating in the bloodstream. And this thing gets stuck or trapped or lodged in the vessel wall. You have neutrophils already present because you're in the bloodstream. They respond. You've got complement already in the bloodstream. It facilitates an inflammatory reaction. And now you've got this vasculitis or this inflammatory disease of the blood vessel wall. Okay. Do you think this is chronic inflammation? Do you think it comes up and goes away? No. So is it chronic or acute inflammation? It's chronic. So do you think you get a lot of scarring? Absolutely. A lot of fibrosis? Absolutely. This persists for a long period of time. So that's essentially what's going on uh, in the blood vessel. Well, we also see, so that's vasculitis. We also see this happen at the level of the kidney, and we call that glomerulonephritis. And it happens within the joint space, which is a reactive arthritis, not to be confused with rheumatoid arthritis. We'll get into rheumatoid arthritis on Wednesday. Okay. And then last but not least is our type four. And I'll give you some examples and then we'll hit the pause button and we'll come back to three and four in more detail on Wednesday. So type four, this is a cell mediated <clears throat> hypersensitivity. So it could be CD4 or CD8. We've got phagocytic cells involved. We get tissue destruction that takes place and it's often delayed. It doesn't happen nearly as quickly as one, two, and three. So our delayed hypersensitivity Here's one where we've got a CD4 positive T cell. Here's an antigen presenting cell showing it to the helper T cell. Helper T cell makes cytokines, triggers inflammation. Okay? T cell mediated cytolysis, the cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes or the CD8 cells, they can actually target the cell itself and destroy it. So when you've got helper Ts or cytotoxic Ts involved, we call this a class four hypersensitivity. So what's some examples of a type four? So Crohn's disease, <clears throat> excuse me. Crohn's disease is um, an autoimmune disease where the body is attacking its GI tract. And you've got chronic inflammation that's happening in these patients. Um, <clears throat> it's classified as a type of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but it has involvement from T cells, and so we would classify it as a type 4. Contact dermatitis. So contact dermatitis is when you've got um, a reaction due, due to certain types of allergens, like poison oak or poison ivy. 
MS, multiple sclerosis. MS with multiple sclerosis, the myelinated nerve is actually attacked by T cells. There are some antibodies that are manufactured, but T cells themselves attack the myelin sheath and they demyelinate the neuron. In an MS patient, as the neurons become progressively demyelinated, their ability for muscle contraction is compromised. Okay, so they go from trouble walking to needing a walker to wheelchair to bedridden. Type 1 diabetes mellitus, okay, um, that's DM type 1. This is, we've talked about this a lot. This is a type 4 where um, patients at a young age are manufacturing uh, T cells that are targeting their pancreatic beta islet cells that make insulin. And so they stop making enough insulin because a lot of those so cells get destroyed. Uh, Hashimoto disease. <clears throat> uh, Hashimoto disease is when the T cells are destroyed, uh, are the T cells destroyed uh, the um, thyroid itself. Okay, and so instead of having a hyperactive thyroid like Graves' disease, you actually have a elimination of the thyroid where you've got Hashimoto disease. Okay. It was discovered by a Japanese physician. That's why it's called Hashimoto's disease. Okay. And my daughter doesn't have Hashimoto. That's what I was worried about. She just has an underactive thyroid. Okay. And it may grow as she grows. Um, but yeah, that was always kind of the, the nervous thing in our mind was, is it, is it Hashimoto's disease? And then the last one that's not on here that I, I want you guys to fill in because it's actually very common these days, and so I've added it sort of to the, uh, to the narrative, is celiac. So celiac disease is a very aggressive type of gluten allergy, okay? But it's not an allergy. It's incorrect to call it an allergy because it's not a type 1 hypersensitivity. So true patients that have a celiac disorder or celiac disease, um, there's a T cell involvement. And so when they have uh, gluten, they harbor an attack against the tissues that have absorbed any of that gluten. And that includes the gastrointestinal tract. And so it's not just that there's antibodies that are reacting and they have sort of an irritable bowel, they get diarrhea. They're actually destroying the intestinal lining with cytolysis. That's true celiac disorder. Okay, and some of you probably, I actually have a really close colleague whose son used to live in Flagstaff, aggressive celiac um, uh, patient, and was misdiagnosed for years. They thought actually he had a heart problem, so they moved out of Flagstaff because the cardiologist in town felt that it, the altitude was causing the issues, and it was actually celiac, okay? It was so aggressive because of the absorption of, of, the, of the gluten, went systemic, the T cells were targeting tissues, even the heart, because of the absorption of the of, of the gluten. Question. Yeah. Yeah, because if it if it goes systemic, anything that's vascularized, the T cells can find that tissue and harbor a harbor a problem. Yeah, that's a big deal. So we'll hit pause there and we'll come back on Wednesday.